Okay, take two. Last one didn't work. First of all, please don't watch this. If this is going to cause you any distress or mental anxiety at all, um, I'm not the SQA. These are just my guesses, not the official answers. Go and study for your next exam instead if you're going to stress, or even better, go outside and enjoy study leave if you've got any left. Right, advanced hire 2023. Um, let's have a look at this. First of all, I'm just going to rip through this nice and quickly. Um, we've got electrons, they fill the 4S before the 3D, so that is the ground state. If, it, if it's an atom, ions are different, but it's not an ion. This one here, only be formed by compounds that contain non-bonding electron pairs. Let me get a pencil. Uh, so trigonal by trigonal pyramidal means that you've got something here, you've got something sticking down here and something else sticking out. The reason these are that shape and not just simply flat when viewed from the side is because of the non-bonding electrons that are here. Oh, three electrons? That's not right. Um, so trigonal pyramidal. Um, this one here, uh, this is a P-block element because it's in the P block. Sorry about the flappy noises. Um, this one here was quite a sneaky one. I quite like this one um, because there were two that were wrong. This person here has thought the same thing. And there were two that look about right at first, except that homogeneous catalysts do not work by adsorption, stick, the molecule sticking to a surface, doing its chemistry thing and then clearing off. So the answer is A for that one. This one here the equivalence point that's halfway down this vertical line is at 6, not 7, so it's not strong and strong. Um, and also, if you notice, the final pH is only about 10, no matter how much alkali we add, so the alkali has to be weak. And if you check down here, the acid started at 1, so I would say it's a strong acid and a weak alkali. Technically speaking, I would like to see the gradient just a little bit gentler on that vertical. It's not actually as vertical as they make it out to be, but that's just me picking, picking nits. Um... I think I was being stupid for this one. I was having some problems with this one, the wordings of it, but I think it might have been me. Um, excess, I assume that's added hydrogen ions. We just call it hydrogen rather than hydronium. It's the same thing, more or less. So I'm going to come to the conclusion that it's a conjugate base that's able to mop up the hydrogen ions that get dripped into your buffer, and the one that provides hydrogen ions in the buffer, that's the weak acid molecules, the whole molecule. Just That's just the conjugate base there. So I think it's D. Um, this one here, uh, a feasible reaction means that the delta G is negative, so these two are out, uh, and if it's feasible, uh, then the delta H tends to be negative, which means the equilibrium tends to favour the products, so I'm going to go with A on that one. This is an unusual Hess's law question. Um, so we're wanting to turn nitrogen dioxide into dinitrogen tetroxide, which is N2O4. So, I'm assuming we'll start with this. So, the nitrogen dioxide is the wrong side of this arrow, so we'll flip that. And N2O4 is on the correct side of this arrow, so we'll just leave that alone. This person seems to have agreed with me. Um, although they've done times two there. Interesting. They don't need to. Or do, oh, do you need to do it times? Hmm. I'm not sure I've got the right answer to that one. I'll maybe come back at the end if I remember. Uh, number nine. Endothermic and uh, an increase in entropy, so more disordered. Uh, that's exothermic, that's more ordered. Uh, that is two gases forming a solid, that is definitely more ordered. So we're going to go with this, which is endothermic evaporation, and you're turning a liquid, which is fairly ordered, into a gas, which isn't. Uh... This is irrelevant. This lets you see what's happening in the rate determining step. There's one X, one Y, so it's A. 11's a toughie because I think even on my video, I don't know if I actually have to go back and check, see if I mention the fact that SP3 hybridization, uh, for single bonds, of course, this is SP3 hybridization, is actually asymmetric. There's a little node here and there's a much larger node here. Um, these are probabilities of finding electrons, of course. Most people tend to neglect that and just do it like that. So, we'll see how this one works. These two are wrong. It's not side-on overlap. It's end-on and asymmetrical, so it's B. A chromophore that absorbs blue-green light? Well, the transition is always homo to lumo, highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied one. And if you're absorbing blue-green light, take a quick look at the data book, find the complementary colour, and it's that. And number 13 of 14. 
uh, no hydrogen bonding. Well, you've got to have oxygen or nitrogen, but not attached to hydrogen. And the only one that fits that bill are the ethers. They have got not got hydrogen bonding. Number 14, haloalkane. Uh, converted into ketone aqueous sodium hydroxide will turn the haloalkane into an alcohol and then uh, oxidation will turn it to ketone, so it's A. More paper noises, sorry. Uh, this is an aldehyde. A reducing agent will turn an aldehyde into an alcohol. If it was me writing this question, I would have had a few alcohols of the wrong structure, but they've only got one there, so it's got to be C. 16. Uh, this reacts or neutralizes actually the carboxylic acid neutralizes uh, the ammonia and produces the salt which if you then cook it up we lose water so we chop off um, two hydrogens from here and uh, the oxygen from there being thick sorry so the answer is that one 17 not an isomer of methoxypropane methoxypropane is an s uh, is an ether sorry and they are isomeric with alcohols so if you look at this, you find all three of these are alcohols, so they're all wrong, and it's that one because it's not an isomer. Which of the following compounds can exhibit geometric isomers? You've got to have... Who wrote this? Whose paper is this? And done three bonds onto that double bonder. You've got to have something here and something different, A and B, and C and D, basically. Um, and the only one that fits that bill is B. Number 19. It's quite a dark question, this. <laughs> Which of the following techniques will the test compound always be destroyed? Uh, well, I suppose the answer to that is mass spectrometry, um, because you break the molecule apart into chunks. Although there's also the molecular ion, which has just got an electron knocked off it, but we'll, we'll let that slide. Uh, this one here, the I reckon uh, that it's a D. The enzyme inhibitor acts at the enzyme site, and it blocks the action of the enzyme. The only one that seemed to be correct to me. This was a nice problem solving on um, the pharmacologically active part of these molecules. Because if you do some detective work, uh, all three of these are active. Obviously, the oxygen is not needed because it's not there. The chlorine is obviously not needed. Um, the nitrogen is not needed either. Uh, and various parts down here. Basically, I came to the conclusion that D was correct. But as I said, I could be wrong. Could entirely be wrong. 22. Uh, this person here has done the work for me, which is nice. Thank you very much, this person. Uh, this is an empirical formula. And if you take the mass, uh, well, turn that into mass, just grams, divide it by the GFM, you get a ratio of 1.2 to 2.4, which is 1 vanadium to 2 oxygens. B. Primary standards is an interesting one. I'm not sure how many primary standards... The SKs want you to memorise. I must go back and have a look at the the ones quoted in this course spec. I mean, being an old uh, fart, I know, fine, that the only one that will work here as a primary standard is calcium carbonate because the others will, for example, this loses HCl as vapour and slowly drops in concentration. This can lose and gain water and this will react with CO2 from the atmosphere and slowly drop. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you just have to know it or maybe work out the others by elimination tough question it's fair enough it's just a tough question this involves my least favorite unit in the world ppm is milligrams per kilogram or milligrams per liter but that's even worse because a liter isn't always a kilogram they're using the better definition here uh, interesting they've picked that number i wonder if they're a hit guide to the galaxy fan or for 42 or a fan of something else i don't know or maybe it's just coincidence of course um so what we got here, we've got the fact that 420 milligrams is in one kilogram of air. We don't have one kilogram of air. We've got that number of kilograms. So multiply by that number, you end up with this number of milligrams. And it's easy to stop here. Oh, no, it's not easy to stop here because they don't have it anyway. Oh, just, oh, that's nice, actually. Somebody in the SQ has actually been giving you a break. I probably would have had that because they want the answer in kilograms, not in milligrams. So divide by a thousand and divide by a thousand again. So it takes six off that index and you end up with that. And 25, this is follow through reaction. So one lead will make one lead chromate. One lead chromate makes one free chromate ion. Two of these free chromate ions would make three iodine molecules. And if we've only got one of these, which is what we started with, uh, we'll make one and a half of that. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.